Dear LLBN family and friends, Dear LLBN family and friends, in the name of Jesus, I welcome each and every one of you to this Global Worship Hour on this very special Sabbath day. Juliana Bayoni will be uh, leading the song and we have the children's story which will be uh, given to us later on and Yen Ang will be lead, leading us in scripture reading so I invite you to take your Bible and prepare it so that you can uh, follow along and Pastor Sam Lenore will be speaking God's word today and the message is follow me and today in leading the praise will be Juli Juliana Bayoni vocal, Ricardo Reina trumpet and Sheldon Lee on the keyboard and also today for the offering we'll have uh, Sheila Hodgkin to lead us so that we can return to God the blessings that He's given to us and Yin's uh, scripture reading if you want to prepare for it is from, found in Mark chapter 1 verses 16 to 17 and I invite you to prayerfully approach the throne of God together with us as we worship God together thank you
myself away. I give myself away. So you can use me. I give myself away. ourselves to you. We surrender all and we choose to follow you tonight, this week, this month, and for the rest of our lives. We want to release everything that is ours so that we can be filled with you. Lord, here we are. Here we stand. Use us, Lord, and guide us with your we give ourselves away and ask that you receive the only gift that we have to give our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That was just beautiful. I love that sentiment. I give myself away so Jesus can use me. And that is precisely what this offering is about. We, I would love to um, give you the scripture from Romans 12, 6 through 8, which says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You have all many gifts. Some are called to give more and some are called to give less. But when we are called to give, we are called to give generously. Would you consider being the body of Christ with us by giving now in our weekly opportunity to give back to God? And may he use what we give to the glory of God. God. Good evening and happy Sabbath. Our story tonight comes from many years ago in the old days when there was a little tiny school in the Appalachian Mountains. This school had a big problem because there were such unruly students in this old school that they could not keep a teacher for very long. They kept leaving. Well, one day, a new teacher came, and he walked through the door and was greeted the same way that they usually greeted their teachers, with a boisterous noise, very unruly behavior. And up in the back, a boy named Tom stood up and said, Oh, guys, we don't even need to worry about this teacher. He's just a little guy. I've got him all by myself. I'll take care of him. Well, the teacher walked to the front and very calmly said, Good morning, class. I'm here to teach school. But before we begin, 
we need to make some classroom rules. What are they going to be? I need your help. Let's make the rules. And so the students started to say, I know, no being late. We have to be on time, okay? The teacher wrote them down. No stealing, okay? The teacher wrote it down. Pretty soon there were 10 rules on the blackboard and the teacher turned around and said, all right, students, now we need a punishment. What is going to happen if the rules are not kept? Well, another student had a suggestion because back in those days, they were the teachers would even spank the students. And so this, the student said, I know 10 whippings on the back with a stick. And everyone said, yeah, 10 whippings on the back with a stick. And then another student said, with no jacket on. Okay, with no jacket. That's quite a harsh punishment, the teacher said. Are you sure that that is what you want? And they said, yes, we're sure, teacher. And so a few days went by and went well. But one day, Tom, that mean boy from the back, stood up and said, oh, teacher, someone stole my sandwich from my lunch. Oh, no, a punishment was going to have to happen. Well, it was found out that little Jim, one of the little guys, had taken Tom's sandwich and eaten it. Jim was called to the front, and the teacher said, Jim, you're wearing a coat, and the rule is you can't have a coat on when I whip you. Oh, the teacher didn't want to do it. He was just a little guy. Please, Mr. Mr. Teacher, please don't make me take my jack off, jacket off. You can whip me as hard as you want, but please don't make me take my jacket off. Well, the teacher had to make him do it. He took his jacket off, and everyone in the room went silent. All of the students were, were looking. The teacher was silent because little Jim didn't even have a shirt on. Little Jim, you see, was so poor that he hadn't had his lunch of his own. And he wasn't even wearing a shirt because his mom had been washing the only shirt that he had that day. And so he was wearing his jacket. The classroom was silent. What was the teacher going to do? He did not want to whip little Jim. Silence. In the back of the classroom, then, Tom stood up and he said, Mr. Teacher, Please, don't punish Jim. And he bravely walked down the center aisle of the classroom. He came to the front and he took Jim's punishment that day. And kids, that is what Jesus has done for you. We're like little Jim. We've done lots of naughty things. We deserve to be punished. But Jesus loves us. He's our best friend. And he has taken our punishment and he wants us to accept that gift today. Thank you, Jesus. Dear friends and brothers and sisters, let us turn our eyes to the Word of God. The scripture today is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Verse 17, Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you out to fish for people. Oh, my 
Amen. Well, it is an honor to be with you tonight at this worship service. It's an honor to speak from the book of Mark. Pastor Dan and Pastor Reuben have both spent some time in the book of Mark. And what I like to do today is spend a couple of moments talking about one of the most powerful moments in all of Scripture, a moment that I love. It's already been read one time, but I would like to read it again one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And he goes a little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John in a boat repairing their nets and he called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. And I'd love to just spend a few moments asking some questions about what is happening here. Now, if you're a church person, you've heard this text read a million times, or maybe this is the first time if you've never really spent time in Scripture. There's something really powerful happening here. The first question that I'd like to address is this. What is actually, what is actually Jesus doing first in his ministry? What's his first move? If you know your task is to change the world, if you know your mission is massive in its scope and its reach, and you want to transform lives and transform communities, how do you start this ministry? Jesus' first move is not to declare that he's running for Messiah, that he's going to be the savior of the world. He doesn't assemble a political team to advise him on this. He doesn't hire a capable marketing company or a publicist to prepare him for all of the public speaking he's going to do. He doesn't develop a logo or spend time with a strategist. He doesn't write a book and begin touring. He doesn't buy a beautiful building. Uh, what is the first thing that Jesus does to begin his ministry to change the world? He builds a team. This is what he's doing here. Before he does anything else, he builds a team of people who will follow him, learn what he does, and eventually be the ones who carry out the accomplishing of the work of bringing hope to the world. He builds a team. That's the very first thing Jesus does. And that's really important for us to remember that Jesus is first concerned about building a team. And who is he recruiting? Why, where is he recruiting is the second question I think is important for us to ask. 
Why is he walking the shore of Galilee? Why didn't he go to a major city like Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, one of the educational centers of his time? Now, he's in the back roads in the little towns. He's out there in the middle of nowhere on the shores of Galilee. He's inviting people that no one knew, who were not important, who had no power, no pool, no influence. He's inviting anyone who will answer his call. Why is he not inviting anyone from his hometown of Nazareth, where he's from? Here's, a, here's, a, here's some questions that I think are relevant to ask. He spent the first 30 years of his life, well, the first 28 years of his life, in Nazareth, growing up there. He's probably related to most people in Nazareth, the, the little village of Nazareth. We think of it as a city, but it's really a village of Nazareth. It has maybe two or 300 people living in it. And Jesus probably knows everyone, or he's related to a lot of people in that city. Why didn't he go there first, assemble his brothers or his cousins, his friends, his neighbors? Why didn't he say to them, hey, let's, let's go change the world together? Why does he go so far away to begin this ministry? Well, I think the answer to that question is that sometimes when you answer the call, when you obey and you follow, when you hear Jesus' call, when you accept that big mission in the world, even your own family, your own people, will not understand. They will not get it. They won't know what you're up to. And we know this is the case for Jesus because sometime later in Luke, the Gospel of Luke 4 records him going back to Nazareth and explaining to people who are listening to him in his synagogue, hey, everything that's been predicted about the Messiah is fulfilled in me. I was risky. They took him outside and they were going to kill him. They were going to stone him for saying those things. So this is why Jesus is far away from Nazareth far away from his village, not in the educational centers and the important cities of his day. He's not in Jerusalem. He's not in Athens. He's not in Rome. He's actually on the shores of Lake Galilee talking to fishermen, which raises another question. What then are the qualifications for being a follower of Jesus? He doesn't start looking for the most experienced, most, most skilled most educated. There were no applications, by the way, no interviews, uh, no search process, no resumes. He didn't even check anyone's references. Can you imagine a phone call from Jesus checking references on one of the people who he called to follow him? Now, in what relationship and for how long have you known uh, James, the son of Zebedee? What would you say his personality is like? What physical or emotional characteristics have you found him to have that would lend themselves to the work of being one of my followers that will eventually change the world? Now, he just says, Jesus just says to anyone who's listening on that shore, come follow me. And the most important qualification is a willingness to be part of the mission. So if you've ever felt like this is not quite for you, it is for you. If you've ever felt like Jesus wouldn't call me, Jesus would call you. Look at his team, eventually. Eventually, his team is made up of Matthew, a tax collector, on the far left of politics, working with the hated Romans who are, who are occupying Israel. On the far right of his, of his team is Simon the Zealot, who probably wanted to murder someone like Matthew, the tax collector, who hated the Romans, well, didn't, didn't want anything to do with the Romans. Can you imagine the tension in this team? when they first got together. And eventually Jesus will invite people with some of the most messed up, scandalous pasts you can imagine. And he knew he was inviting people who would eventually mess up, just like he invites you and I, knowing that we, some of us have got some messed up past. And some of us are probably going to mess up in the future. Jesus is assembling a team of people he knows will follow him and are instinctively saying, yes, I know what you have to offer is so much bigger than what I'm doing right now. And Jesus knows that we'll also contribute. Now, next question I want to ask about this passage is this. Uh, this, may be, this may be for some of you very basic Christianity, but it bears repeating. We have to really think about who it is that's calling. Who is calling and what is he calling them to? Jesus says, follow me. He doesn't say follow an ideology, follow a philosophy. 
Jesus doesn't say follow a core value or a virtue or a cause. Jesus says, don't, you know, I'm not calling you to follow some code of moral, ethical, or social teachings. Jesus is calling people to himself. He doesn't say, come follow a worldview. You'll eventually develop a worldview. You'll eventually have uh, ethical values you live by. You'll eventually have all these social teachings. But, but he says right now to them, come follow me. He doesn't even say, come join a cause. Because Christianity and following Jesus is more than a cause. Jesus leads us to causes that matter to him. Our pursuit and our desire for justice, for example, is born out of a love for the king, King Jesus, and wanting to see his kingdom enacted in the world. I have a friend who says this all the time. He says, you cannot have the kingdom without the king. You cannot have the kingdom without the king. Jesus is calling us to himself. Here's one that'll Here's one that'll hurt a little if you're a preacher. He didn't call us to follow a church or a preacher or an organization. He didn't call us to follow a specific human being that's preaching Jesus. He's calling us to himself because we humans will disappoint each other. Organizations will eventually disappoint you. But Jesus won't. Jesus is calling us to himself. And this is one, one amazing thing that one of our pioneers in our church wrote 120 years ago that I love so much. He said, he's not, Jesus is not a great truth. He's not a great message. He's not a great movement. He's a great person. Without him, there could be no gospel good news. Without him, there could be no message. He came not so much to proclaim a message, but rather that there may be a message to proclaim he himself was and is the message, not his teachings, but himself constituted Christianity. Did you get that? He came not so much to proclaim a message, but rather that there may be a message to proclaim. He is the message. We follow him. And by the way, this is the most radical claim that we who follow Jesus make that he can be known, he can be loved, he can be experienced, he can be worshipped like we did here today, that he can be embodied by people who gather in his name, and that knowing him profoundly and deeply and in reality, as well as experiencing his unfathomable love, is the pursuit of people who call themselves Christians and who follow Jesus. And the real joy is found in serving him out of an enraptured heart that has been captivated by his irresistible beauty and unfathomable love. This is the Jesus we follow. That's the most radical claim we make, by the way. I believe that this is the heart of the good news. When my son Micah was about six years old, six or seven years old, I was sitting in my office at home one day working on a sermon I was to preach the next day, and I could hear him and his friend Gabriel outside, both the same age. Gabriel and Micah were having an argument that I loved. I could hear him right through my window. The argument went like this. Gabriel went first, his little friend. He said, my dad, my dad is the best. And here's why. My dad has a motorcycle. And little Micah, my son, because he didn't want to be outdone by this argument, he said, no, my dad's the best. And I, this is what boys do sometimes. They argue about whose dad's the best. My son said, not to be outdone, he said, well, my dad has a mountain bicycle, which in his mind thought, he thought, your dad needs an engine, a motorcycle to get him around. My dad has these powerful legs that can get him around on a bicycle. Little Gabriel goes, yeah, well, my dad has this really expensive Mercedes Benz. It's a nice car. I didn't drive an expensive Mercedes-Benz. I had a very old, beat-up Explorer, Ford Explorer from 15 years ago. So my son says to Gabriel, Mercedes, that sounds like a girl name. Now, my dad drives an Explorer. He's going places. So round two, my son thinks, I won this. The argument continues. 
Gabriel says, yeah, well, my father is the owner of a multinational corporation. He threw out this massive verbiage that Micah had no clue how to understand. And in his little mind, he decided, this ends right now. This argument is going to end right now this way. So he turns to Gabriel and he says, well, my father is Spider-Man. Yeah, he said, my father is Spider-Man. And to this day, I have no clue. He didn't grow up watching Spider-Man. I don't know where he got the Spider-Man thing from. But he said it to Gabriel, my dad is Spider-Man. I thought, this is unacceptable. So I walked outside, opened the door. And as I opened the door to the outside, Micah looked at me, Gabriel looked at me, and Micah, my son, immediately knew, you've been listening, oh no. And then his eyes said to me, I did this for you, dad. Don't mess it up. So I looked at Micah and I said, Micah. And then I looked at Gabriel and I said to Gabriel, Gabriel, you must never tell anyone that I'm Spider-Man. That's funny, I know. It's a joke. It's a joke. Well, later he found out I was not actually Spider-Man, but little Gabriel lived with this question in his mind for hours, I imagine. Is he really Spider-Man? It was an outrageous claim. A crazy claim that is not true. Well, here's the thing. I tell you this story because we make an equally outrageous claim that's actually true. And our claim is that Jesus is real. That he's a living person who can be known and loved. He can be experienced. He can be worshipped. And he can be embodied by people who know him and love him when we worship together. That is outrageous. And here's the thing. It's true. Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. Follow Jesus. Never, never follow anything else other than Jesus. Follow him. What is their response? The response of people who are hearing him that day. I want to tell you this, because this is, I find always really interesting. When Jesus called them, he didn't say, come follow me. You're going to be healthy, wealthy, successful, powerful, stress-free, well-fed, popular, safe, admired, loved, liked, appreciated, accepted. Life is going to be absolutely easy and amazing. He didn't say that. He also didn't say, come follow me. We're going to walk around Palestine for three years. I'll perform miracles. Then the Romans working in collusion with the Jewish leaders, are going to have me killed on a cross. It's going to be really bad. You're going to watch it happen. And then you will also be persecuted. Uh, and you'll be persecuted for my sake. And you'll also be killed in pretty horrific ways. None of you are going to live to your old age. You're all going to die. Who's in? He doesn't say that. He simply says, come follow me. And you will do something way more significant with your life than just pulling fish out of the Galilean Sea. Isn't that amazing? He doesn't make any promises about life being easy. He just says, you're going to experience wonder every day. Wonder every day. You are made for adventure. Is it risky? Absolutely it's risky. But think about this. Isn't it riskier to stay in a boat Spending the rest of your life thinking that that's what God called you to do? Saying no to an invitation to adventure? There's risk, but there's risk in both. Wouldn't you rather take the risk of following Jesus? I want to tell you this. I think it's also amazing that, that Jesus calls these people in the middle of the workday. That he doesn't call them during some quiet time when they're reflecting and studying and, and praying he doesn't call them when they're at their synagogue, just having spent time in scripture studying. He interrupts their workday. Jesus shows up in the middle of the most inopportune, the most, he's just, he's just not waiting for the right time. Right now, Jesus? Yeah, right now. I love this because that's when Jesus calls. And I, as a pastor, would love to think that people make their, their deepest commitments, their most profound commitments to Jesus when we are preaching or when we're in church, when we're in retreats, when, we're, when the atmosphere has been set correctly for these things. But, but that's not the case. As I found Jesus 
in scripture, I found the story of Jesus. He's calling people in the middle, in the middle of their everyday work life. I have a friend who works in an emergency room and he had been praying through, wanting, wanting Jesus to show him how he could be called into a mission, something deeper in his life. And one day at the end of a long shift, he was about to head to his car go, going home. Someone came up to him and said, hey, that young man who's been here twice before this week, he's back in the emergency room and he wants to see you. So my friend said, no, I'm headed to my car. It's been a long day, a long shift. I'm worn out. I'm not going to do this right now. Someone else can take care of it. The person telling him said, no, this young man is insisting that you're the one he wants to see. And at that moment, my friend who has been praying, hey, Jesus, follow me. Teach me how I can follow you. He said he had this sense that he was being called by the spirit to go back into that room and talk to this young man. So he went back into the room and he said, okay, apparently I'm supposed to take care of you right now. What is it that you need? The young man said, I'm hungry. Can you give me something to eat? My friend says, well, I'm a highly trained physician. That's not really my job. And then he heard the voice of Jesus say, follow me, do this, follow me. So he said, fine, I'll go and found him some food, brought it to him. And then he said, what else can I do for you? And the young man said, my, my feet hurt. Could you, could you take a look? My friend said he took his socks off and he found his feet were just filthy, gross. So he said, I'm going to wash your feet and he found himself on his knees, washing his feet, not realizing that this is all part of the movement of the Spirit on his heart and his soul. And he's actually enacting a very scene from the life of Jesus. He's actually kneeling, washing this young man's feet. When he's done washing his feet, he says, okay, are we done now? Can I go? The young man says, no. Can you call my dad? And my friend says, okay, well, great, give me, give me his phone number. So a young man gives him the phone number to call, and my friend walks outside to make this phone call, and he gets on the phone, and it's now like 1 a.m. in the morning. Phone rings in someone's home. The voice on the other end, groggy, says, hello. My friend says, hey, this is Dr. Last Name calling you from the emergency department at this hospital. Your son has asked me to call you. And he says that there was a long pause, just a long pause, and then the voice on the other end began screaming out loud into wherever he was. They found him. They found my son. They found my son. And then he, get, he got back on the phone and he said, hey, can you please hold him? It's been two years. We've been looking for him. Can you please hold him until I get there? And so he did. <clears throat> he waited another two hours until this family came over. They drove in. And then my friend described with tears in his eyes how this father went and scooped up his son and hugged him and said, you're coming home with me. Oh, you imagine how that day, that night would have turned out differently had my friend said, not right now. It's the end of my shift. Not right now, Jesus. I've got other things I got to do. Not right now. I'm tired. Not right now. Sometimes when it's more convenient, is when I'll say, yeah, I'll follow you right now. Imagine how this would have turned out. But instead, because he said yes, he got to witness a miracle. A miracle of a father and son reunited. A son, we hope, on his way to health. A son, we hope, on the way to well-being. When Jesus says, follow me, answering is never easy. It's always risky. But I'll tell you what, when we say yes, the adventure begins. As um, our musicians are coming back to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus, I pray that as you listen to this music, your heart will be moved. And that you, if you haven't in a long time, or maybe if you're, you haven't ever heard the voice of Jesus say, follow me, that you'll hear it tonight, you'll hear it today. And as you hear that, you'll also be compelled like the first hearers of that invitation to, as scripture says, at once and immediately they dropped their nets, they dropped whatever they were doing, and they followed. Jesus. 
turning back, no turning back. The world behind me. You know, some time ago, about 10 years ago, I was across the world, exactly around the globe in a city called Perth, Australia, speaking at a camp meeting, a big gathering of Christians. And as I was walking away from the main auditorium, the main tent where I had been speaking, a young man was following me and he followed me for a couple of seconds. And I realized that he was staring at me, trying to decide if he knew me. And here's what happened. So, I turned around and I said, hey, do we know each other? And he said, hey, we don't know each other, but I live out in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Australia. And we've got this generator, which is the only way we can actually get electricity. And the only TV we have is connected to a satellite dish in the middle of nowhere in Australia, where we watch LLBN. And then he said, I've seen you on a show that I used to be on 15 years ago. I've seen you and some of your friends and some of the students that, that, you, that you're on the show on. And then he said, that, that show and the watching LBN has just transformed my life, my family, our whole community. That is, I believe, what happens through this ministry, this miracle. You never know where these seeds are falling around the world. And this miracle is possible, yes, by the work of the Holy Spirit, but also by by the fact that some people have said for years, we're going to follow Jesus. We're going to take risks. We're going to invest here. We're not going to count the cost. We're going to say, Jesus, you want us to follow? You want us to do this ministry, this TV ministry, this internet ministry? We're going to do it because we believe that this is the adventure you call us to. So I want you to know that, that this LLBN ministry is having an impact in places that we have no clue about. And I want to talk to you now as we close in prayer. If you've never said yes to following Jesus, today's the day, do it. And may you be blessed. God, I pray this prayer. May you be blessed, you who are listening to this. In your heart, knowing the Spirit is calling you. Confident that he who calls you will be the one who equips you and makes you the, the one, the person, the disciple that you want to be eventually. I pray blessing on you as you step out of those boats and throw your nets down and follow Jesus today. In his holy name I pray. Amen.
See you.